Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this episode, and welcome to the Goddess Project podcast. I'm Dr. Carla Ionescu, and I will be your host. Today, we're going to be talking about Kai Billy, who I've been waiting to talk about for a very, very long time. Um, if you're new to the podcast, welcome, welcome. One of the things that I want to share with you is that this podcast is totally informal. Um, it's non, not edited. <laughs> So uh, there may be a lot of ums and ahs and pauses and sometimes revelations as I go through the material. Um, I have some notes with me, but usually I prepare uh, during the week by doing all the research and then creating a little sort of image PowerPoint for those of you who are watching me on YouTube. If you're watching me on, or if you're listening to me on Spotify, that's okay. Uh, you don't need the images per se. I will either describe them or you can find them on my Instagram at the Goddess Project podcast Instagram. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to learn more about my work, my area of expertise is the Goddess Artemis and the Mesopotamian, Greco, Roman, and recently Balkan and Sicilian and other aspects of the Goddess Artemis. This is my life's work. I've published a book called She Who Hunts, Artemis Who Changed the World, and that is based on the Greek Artemis, and I'm working on Artemis of Ephesus now, and then um, I'm excited to begin work on a couple of other geographical areas on Artemis. Um, I'm also leaving for my trip in April. Um, if you follow my social media on Artemis Expert everywhere, TikTok, I don't know, Instagram everywhere, you will know that I am getting ready to sort of shift my life uh, from teaching at the university to being more of an explorer, documenter, researcher, and dare I say, even a film producer, <laughs> although I produce my own films. Uh, but I would really love to take you guys with me uh, to some of the places that I'm going. Uh, my goal for this summer certainly is to begin mapping Artemis's temples myself and using my own photographs and descriptions and taking you guys with me. So in short, that is uh, my work. If you've been with me for a while, you know all about it because I talk about it all the time. I'm sorry. Um, and if you're new, then uh, welcome. Today, we are going to go over Kaibali. Um, I'm going to go into some detail here, particularly about things that I find fascinating, but I'm also setting up an online course on Kaibili through the Artemis Center. So if this piques your interest into this goddess and you want to learn more in the sense of uh, a more detailed lecture, uh, online lecture, and maybe more readings and more guidance in learning about, especially primary text or early mythology about Kaibili, uh, then please sign up for my online course uh, through the Artemis Center. It is totally um, pre-prepared for you. So you go through it at your own pace. Uh, you do the readings at your own pace. You listen to the lectures at your own pace. And it will have more detail than what we have time to talk about um, here today. But that being said, I'm very, very excited to begin talking about Kaibali. Last week in my workshop, we also do workshops through the Artemis Center. Last week in my workshop, we covered, I did a short lecture about maybe 20 minutes uh, for all of the, for all my students in the workshop on Kai Bailey. And we had, it, it, it opened up such a conversation that we didn't even have enough time. You know, the workshop is two hours long and we didn't even have enough time to really discuss all of the, particularly the rituals and the festivals for this goddess. And so I thought this would be a good way to add to that, um, to talk about Kaibali, but also spend some time looking at the festivals and the rituals and her relationship with Attis and things like that. Um, and like I said, then from this grows a longer course. I would say that the course would take about three weeks, but you can finish it also in one week if you go through all the lectures um, as you're you know, sitting around. So it's, she's such a fascinating goddess that there's so much to say. Uh, I could probably do a whole 12-week course on her, um, and maybe one day I will. Uh, but I just find her, yeah, I just find her so fascinating. So 
So let's let's get into it and see what makes her so special. So I titled this um, episode Soaked in Blood and Sacrifice. And I did so because there is so much controversy. There was so much controversy when uh, Kaibali was worshipped. Although, to be fair, I'm going to also show you that there, she, there is a cult that also continues to worship her today um, in New York City, of all places. Maybe we shouldn't call them a cult, a group, an organization. Uh, but I find her rituals fascinating. I find them quite bloody. And I also find that people have a lot of problems when they are when they are faced with the bloodiness of the past. And this has been something that's come up repeatedly recently. And I, I don't have a straight answer for you, but I think it's definitely worth a discussion for all of us. That is, you know, do we worship or can we worship the ancient gods in the way that they were worshipped in the past? And of course, most, much of that answer is no, because there was so much sacrifice and so much blood and so much, in this case, castration and, and other things. Um, and if not, then how do we make up for the loss of what we were offering before. And now some people have suggested to me that the gods are adaptable, that the divine is adaptable, and that this is the modern period and therefore modern so-called offerings or so-called sacrifice and offerings um, are enough. But are they? You know, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, of course, that would imply that the ancients were not evolved, right? When we use that kind of terminology um, or that the ancients <sighs> worshipped in a much more organic or violent way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the blood and sacrifice for her. In fact, I'm going to talk a lot about it. Uh, but I want you to keep in mind, how would a goddess like this adapt like what would be required to make up for the loss let's say of those rituals yeah so that's something to keep in mind and I think that will come up as we go through the next several goddesses that I have in mind because they can all be seen a little bit as I don't want to say they're bloodthirsty because actually that's not true but that the sacrifice is impactful impactful so that the goddess doesn't drink your blood or need your blood but the commitment of offering some of your blood is the impact that they're looking for again this is something i've been thinking about so you know take it take it as blood. again i am not um, a cult or an organization at least not yet um perhaps through the artemis center i am starting a kind of goddess revival I, I hope so but certainly we will not have blood sacrifices <laughs> at least not yet <laughs> so we shall see but let's begin with Kylie yeah let's, let's refocus Carla refocus so Kylie uh is often referred to as Metertheon in Greek and I will probably refer to her in that way several times um, that really means sort of the great mother or the mother of the gods. That's really actually maybe a better translation, the mother of the gods or mother goddess. People often refer to um, it's a powerful name because the there is an implication of a creator here. So she and we'll talk a little bit about how she may have been seen as the creator of all the gods or she predates all the gods. She certainly predates the Greek gods certainly the male gods. And so she could be a great mother, the great mother or the mother of the gods. She was also known as the mistress of animals. So if you've seen some of my past episodes, you know that the mistress of animals is so central. And in fact, I have an episode in mind for the mistress of animals, but the the research required for that is quite um, wide. And by that, I mean, geographically speaking. So it takes some time to put that together. But the mistress of animals seems to be one of the key terms or key labels or names for 
many goddesses that come from high places that are embedded in nature that deal with fertility birthing and have a wildness to them so of course as you know artemis is that and if you watch the episode on artemis you know i i make that connection with the mistress of animals often um but there are other goddesses that also claim that name and that's because when the divine was walking around or going around and i'm i'm sort of anthropomorphic anthropomorphizing you know what i mean the divine um she was nameless in a sense she didn't have a name and she was called the mistress of animals or the mistress of the mountains or the mistress of the wild um and so before i don't know 5000 8000 years ago or around that time goddesses or the divine the sacred feminine divine tended to be unnamed unspecified and so we have these mistresses of different spaces which then eventually as the greeks settle in and the romans of course they they end up getting very specific names and then they end up being sort of separated into smaller and smaller divinities etc cetera, etc cetera. so we know that she was an anatolian mountain deity but she ends up becoming the guardian of the roman state so this really illustrates her adaptability and the enduring symbolism of the sacred feminine across ancient societies. So in the workshop that I'm running right now, um, it's called Goddess Migrations because, and Kybele is of course one of the key features in this, because there is so much adaptability that goes on through the migration process in the ancient world that it's important that we talk about it and that we talk about sort of the psychology of that, the ideology of that, people moving around, sharing the sacred feminine, sharing their goddesses, then sort of compacting one goddess into three, right? So we end up having later on Kybele Aphrodite, or we end up having Isis Aphrodite, or we end up having, you know, Artemis of Ephesus, who is a combination of like four different goddesses, and that's really important. I'm not sure we talk about that a lot. I think we come out of an archaeological and anthropological culture where we separate cultures. And, and I'm I'm good with that because sometimes we need to look at them very specifically. But there's something going on here in the migration, in the adaptability that I think certain goddesses were really, really attractive to everyone in large regions or, you know, maybe even globally. Um, so... Kybele is one of these goddesses, um, and she, of course, she's famous for her eunuch uh, priest, the galley, which we're going to talk about. Um, her worship challenged societal gender norms um, that we know of as today. Again, did they challenge the societal gender norms at the time? That's something we're going to talk about because that is unclear. But as far as the later, um, so for example, the Romans and later on the Christians, she really challenged their, their, their what they were trying to set up as gender norms. Um, the Romans saw her as a Phrygian outsider, and she was often referred to as the mother goddess of ancient Troy for the Romans. So we're going to look a little bit at that. Um, the worship of Kybele was entrusted to the plebeians. So the plebeians are, you know, the Roman word for everyday people. So it's very, very important that we know that even though, so there's two, two layers to this, as we'll see. The plebeian organized the festivals and were trusted with her. However, there are some festivals or some initiations that ended up, especially during the Roman period, becoming totally elite and ex so expensive that only the elite can, can um, participate. And one of the fascinating things about Kybele is that she begins as a servant goddess that the Phrygian slaves, the Phrygian servants bring her or those that are, you know, caught in, in or victims of war and um, by the Greeks and later on by the Romans. Um, and so she, how do I say this? She is the goddess of everyday people. And then as she grows in popularity, she becomes the goddess of the elite or the elite begin to take over her festivals more and more. So again, one of these fascinating timelines uh, that, we're, that we can go through. Okay. So let's talk about sort of her timeline. 
Uh, we are going to look at her in the Anatolian period. We're going to look at her in the Greek period, and we're going to look at her in the Roman period. We're going to look at the board for all of those things. Um, she is a universal deity. So who is the great mother? She's a universal deity. She is often depicted sitting on a throne and flanked by lions. So we're going to look at the very first piece that we have of her, which is an Anatolian artifact. There is this really uh, long and deep association between Kybele and lions. But one of the things that I've been thinking about and I've been discussing with my students is the fact that initially she is flanked by li what appear to be lionesses. And then eventually she begins to be flanked by male lions, and especially by the Roman period. And that this implies the shift of power between the everyday people, you know, honoring the sacred feminine, uh, between the power of the lionesses. Now, if we know, th you know, if you know anything about lions, you know that. Uh, while the lion does a great job sitting around all day and maybe protecting from another lion, protecting pack from another lion coming in, the lioness is the, the lionesses is, is the one are the ones that are really running the show. They hunt in packs, they raise their children together, they hang out together all the time. Um, they have their own collaborative structure, um, and they're a really powerful image for the sacred feminine or a matriarchy. I would say they're a kind of a wild animal matriarchy and one of the most visual. Hyenas are also a matriarchy. Um, hyena, of course, come out of the canine family, but hyenas are also a matriarchy. They're a more hierarchical uh, matriarchy, but it's just fascinating to me that the images of male animals like lions or bulls or you know antlered deer or male deer um are our modern depictions of power and in the ancient world we could see very clearly or in the animal kingdom we could see very clearly um that the power structure leans heavily on some of these matriarchal animals yeah Sorry, that was a little side event there. But it's important because Kaibali is seen as the mother of not only the gods, but of all the humans, of animals in nature. Um, she has this symbol of nurturing, as we'll see, especially in Anatolia. And so she's often as um, associated with fertility, but not just fertility, but creating, right? So there's a creation here. Fertility is one thing, but creating a thing is something else. Right. And that's really, really important. Uh, we have evidence that suggests wor uh, worship that dates all the way back to the sixth millennia BCE. Some people say seventh, eighth millennia BCE, um, which is a good, you know, 10,000 years ago, let's say. And we see religious spaces for her, you know, spanning back 5,000 years. So a really prominent and primary goddess. Now, the name Kaibeli can be traced back to Sumerian, myth Sumerian, not Sumerian, Sumerian mythology, uh, where she appears as Kug Bau, a former barmaid who became the queen of Kish around the second half of the third millennium BCE. Then by the second millennium BCE, the Babylonians de deified her as Kubaba, Kubaba, Kaibeli, you could see that, with the Babylonian god Marduk, allegedly elevating her to queenship. So here we may see the connection between or the explanation for her sitting on a throne with lions. Okay, so by this time, we're moving forward to where the representation of the animal beside her is more of a masculine or a lion rather than a lioness. Uh, Kybil's um, worship involved really intense rituals, as we'll see, orgiastic frenzies and ritual castration by her followers, especially by her priests and uh, who are called the galley or the galai, depends on what you're reading, uh, who then assumed a type of feminine identity and lived in a, in a feminine way, yeah? Female priestesses also played a key role, um, dev leading devotees in ecstatic rituals featuring music and drumming. So we're gonna look at drumming um, and how important sound was in the worship of Kaibali. 
Under the leadership of August Caesar, Kybele's popularity surged in Rome. Uh, Augustus commissioned a grand temple dedicated to her on Pal Palatine Hill, uh, where it featured this statue of the likeness of his wife, Livia, as Kybele. So later on, especially during the Roman, but also during some of the Greek period, but especially during the Roman period and the Egyptians actually love to feature themselves or their, you know, special whoever um, as gods, right? So embodied as gods. And so, the, you know, often we look at these as symbols of status and elitism, which I agree, but there is also something here, maybe a little bit deeper about embodying the God. So think about today, for example, how many of us would create a statue? Let's say in Christianity, let's pick Christianity since there's lots of statues in Christianity, especially Catholicism. But how many of us would order a statue of ourselves as Mary, right? Or ourselves as Jesus, like our, you know, our facial representation, but then depicted as Mary or depicted as Jesus. That would be seen, that's unheard of. And yet in the ancient world, this is something that's very, very popular, especially among the rich, because of course it took a lot of money to um, order one of these representations. But think about the relationship with the divine that you must believe you have in order to embody the divine and then represent yourself publicly as embodying that divine. And the one thing that I want you to think about is why do we stop doing that, right? Why did we move from the idea that we could embody the divine, that the divine would be honored by us spending money representing ourselves embodied by them into a much more servant mentality, a much more obedient head down, you know, don't mention God, don't depict God, don't do this with, you know, we moved into what I call the servant mentality religion, which is much of monotheism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are servant religions, which means they celebrate servitude. They celebrate bowing. They celebrate on your knees. They celebrate poverty, right? They celebrate being in service, like they call it. And well, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those aspects of living life, uh, you know, uh, those are very honorable aspects in some ways, but in many ways, it also creates a psychology of servitude um, and then a kind of relationship with the divine that is not a collaboration that is more um, a servant, master servant mentality. Yeah. So Kaibali's uh, worshippers saw themselves as engaged with her. And as we'll look, when we we'll look at her priest, we'll see that they saw themselves as embodying her, as living her, right? Living her every day. And that's very, very significant when we think about the sacred divine or divine feminine worship. I've given you a temple, uh, I've given you a map of the temples um, of the great mother. Uh, I cannot say that this is a complete map. I'm really becoming obsessed with mapping. I would love to do something like this for the goddess Artemis. And I am. I'm starting to work in Eastern Greece this summer. Um, and I want to thank some of you for supporting my travels through my Patreon and literally some of you through my PayPal. Uh, I'm starting a fundraiser uh, to raise money for some of these travels because, you know, I mean... The explorer in me says, yay. And then the Capricorn in me says, how are you going to fund all of this? So, but I think it's very important that we map temples. And there are some maps out there. There are great, great maps out there, um, obviously for the worship of Kybele and even for the worship of Artemis, but they're very incomplete and slightly inaccurate and for Artemis. And so I really, you know, I, I don't know. I'm feeling really called to create this kind of Google map um, and evidence how popular divinities, certainly goddesses were in the ancient world. And some of you might be like, well, like, duh, of course we know that, but look at this map. I mean, if you're not, if you're listening to me on Spotify, this map has like 50 red dots all over, you know, a little bit of North Africa, um, 
the Mediterranean, Anatolia, all over Europe, even up into um, North, you know, the Nordic area or Nordic Europe and out, you know, out towards Asia as well. And so when you see something like this, you understand the migration, right? You understand the importance of moving around. But more importantly, I think you understand how inspired people were by this goddess you know because it wasn't a, co a forced conversion it wasn't like you know like christianity i mean it wasn't something that people went here you must now follow kai Billy. um people welcomed created yes the romans used their politically of course i mean of course the po politics always bleeds into religion and power but people enjoyed enjoyed her in such a way connected with her in such a way that we have a plethora of of temple sites and so i thought i would show you this visually and also mention it for those of you who are listening because it is it is important especially if you listen to my last episode as we are moving into what i feel like is a bit of an erasure of the goddess maybe not a bit is an erasure of the goddess there seems to be a silent backlash against the terminology of goddess, certainly, or divine feminine. And I think it's very important that we, me, and maybe some of you, keep up the pressure on archaeology, anthropology, classics, to offer the knowledge of this was a longer period in human history than any of the monotheistic traditions have experienced so far. So, you know, if we go back to the eighth millennia for Kaibali, that's 10,000 years ago. And at least 8,000 of those years, she was massively popular. And, you know, mono Judeo Christianity Islam, or maybe at best 3,500 years, even if I give you 5,000 years for, you know, the Hebrews and the Canaanites and things, which again is a bit of a stretch. Not even comparable, not even comparable. And the irony is that Kaibali's worship is coming back, right? So it's like, even though they might have been able to subdue that worship for 2000 years, let's say, it is coming back. And so the power of that, like blows my mind, you know, because it's not the goddess per se that brings that <clears throat> forward. It's us, like, we are reaching back through time to her and bringing her here. So, and we are reaching back to other goddesses. For me, of course, Artemis and the mistress of animals and, and further back. But for others, right, we are reaching back and pulling the gods through the last 2,000 years into the future. And I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm I'm supporting it. I'm fighting for it. Yeah, the re the return of the goddess. I've also given you a timeline here. So if you're listening to me, I'm just going to go through it. Um, and if you're watching this, then you could kind of see here. And it's exactly what I've just said, which is that in the Neolithic, which is six, let's say six to eighth millennium BCE. So, you know, 8,000 to 10,000 years ago, we have a type of divinity that seems to echo Kaibali worship. So like I said, she is not yet here named Kaibali, but she begins, uh, she is represented. So we have a seated goddess with lions or lionesses. Uh, certainly here we have lionesses in the Neolithic um, that then continues to be represented this way for the next you know, 10,000 years. Then we enter the Anatolia period, 8th century BCE. So now we're getting much, much closer to our modern period, we see the rise of the Phrygian culture in Anatolia. And here we see Kaibali as a term, as a label, as a name, and she now begins to really gain popularity. We then enter Greece in the 5th century BCE, um, where Kaibali's influence now goes into Greece. Yeah. And there's an assimilation of her into Greece. And then we head into Rome, somewhere between the 5th century BCE and 204 BCE. We're going to talk about how she comes to Rome. In 204 BCE, we have a formal establishment of her cult in Rome. She arrives as Magna Mater, which is the great mother uh, from Pisinius. Yeah. And then uh, 
we see that she continues on to the 4th century BC, uh, sorry, the 4th century CE, so it, within Christianity. Now we know that by the 4th century when Christianity is now enforced, right? It's a forced religion. We see that the traditional pagan religions start to disappear, mostly because, you know, if you're a pagan, you're dead, right? So you either have to be a Christian to live or not. And so we see a sort of underground movement. She kind of falls off. Uh, the only time that we see her a lot in the last 2000 years is in art, uh, usually Christian art um, that, that sort of fetishizes the ancient gods, but no worship until the more modern period like today, where we see organizations popping up um, and beginning or continuing to worship Kybele. So let's talk about Kybele in Anatolia. So this is the image. Now, if you Google Kybele, if you're listening to me um, and you're not watching, if you Google Kybele, you will get this image of this um, larger woman sitting on a chair with two lionesses beside her. I'm sure you've seen this image, but if you can Google at any time. Um, this is the image that comes out of Katal Hayuk. Um, and she's flanked by these large felines. Lo definitely looks like uh, lionesses. This piece is in the Museum of Anatolia today in Turkey. So if you ever go to Turkey, I highly recommend you look at this piece. It's very small. It would fit in the in the palm of your hand. Uh, yeah, it would fit in the palm of your hand. Maybe it's not quite that small, but you can hold it in your hand. Um, and it looks like she's giving birth. So as she's sitting on the throne between her legs, something there's a there's a there's something that's coming out from under her or between her legs. And so this has often been referred to as giving birth. Because the piece is corrupted um, in the sense that it's done roughly, um, it's it's unclear whether, to me, sometimes this looks like a baby feline. And that would fit well with the mistress of animals, although that's kind of a weird imagery of a goddess or a sacred feminine giving birth to a feline. But some people argue that this is a baby in a, in a placenta. Okay. I also have this image here um, on the side, and you can also find this image. This is a massive, um, a massive image that, hmm, that was carved into the cliff face at the Tas Suret site in Turkey, which bears a striking resemblance. So it's a massive, so in this image, there is a man standing about, and I would say that this piece is like two stories high, if not three stories high, okay? So this is a massive uh, depiction of Kaibeli or certainly the a goddess or a divine being sitting on a throne with what looks like to be felines on either side. So we know that this imagery goes back to at least the 6th millennium BC or more. And we find this evidence at, at Katal Huyuk, which is in modern day Turkey. And this cult seems to be to have been embraced by the Hurrian and later on by the Hittite civilization in Anatolia. So, like I said before, the earliest Kaibel evidence that we have is this uh, cult that worshipped a goddess named Kubaba, which or which originates from Carchemish, which is a Neo-Hittite city in the middle of the Euphrates, and then Mount Didymon in eastern Phrygia served as another center of early worship. Okay, so here, nearby Pessinus uh, is situated at the mountain's base. And here, there's a venerated goddess that was under the names of Matar and Agdistis. Now, we're going to talk about Agdistis in after the podcast because Agdistis is such a fascinating divine representation aside, alongside or part of Kybele. Anyway, we're going to get that. It's going to be very, very exciting. Um, but there's lots of these representations in early Anatolia and early Phrygia. So Kaibali continues, and her priesthood actually continues to be independent, despite the fact that there's so in Phrygia, there's a lot of successive rulers, there's Gurdium's kings, there's Lydian kings in Sardis, there's the Achaemenid uh, Persians, there's the Seleucids. There's lots of change of power in this in this area, in this geographical space. And yet her worship continues. And we are told that her priests tend to keep some type of political independence well into the Roman era. So there's something about her 
worship that allows for political independence. Again, some fascinating things are going on here. Um, almost as though politics, of course, played a key role, but allowed for her worship was so popular that that none of the rulers that changed hands wanted to um, destroy or get rid of her. Uh, she is often depicted as a, a mistress of wild nature, as we've seen, the master and protector of nature. Often people say that the lions represent, many people say the lions also represent royalty and her representation as queen. That That is more of a Roman, uh, later hierarchical interpretation. Uh, she also, of course, governs birth and life. And you can see here in this image in Turkey and at Katal Hayuk that she seems to certainly be giving birth. Um, and we see the size from something that fits in the palm of your hands to something that is that can fit on a, you know, that is two, three stories high. Still a mystery, you know, still a mystery, this goddess. We see her impact, but... Um, and we know about some of her worship, but I think it's a I think it's a mystery, or perhaps we overlook how powerful she was. Uh, perhaps not. Maybe that's just my interpretation. I did promise you that I would talk about sound and worship. So, one I've given you a couple of pieces of primary text here, which I love. But one of the most fascinating aspects of the orgiastic rites, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, was the sound. So, Kaibeli's worship is very very sound centered very sound centered um so here's a couple of homeric hymns so these are of course from the 7th and 4th century bce so um they don't go back 8000 years but good enough yeah uh one of the homeric hymns number 14 says the meter theon so the mother of the gods is well pleased with the sound of rattles and of timbrels with the voices of flutes and the outcry of wolves and bright-eyed lions with echoing hills and wooded com wooded combs. So there is this connection, deep, deep connection between sound, roaring, howling, dancing, and drums and Kaibali. Pindar, a little bit later, says, in the adorable presence of the mighty Metar Theon, mother of the gods, the prelude is the whirling of timbrels. There is also the ringing of rattles and the torch that blazes beneath the glowing pine trees. So often torch, so we know that the festivals are held at night. Uh, we'll see that Kaibeli is a Chthonic goddess. So she is a goddess that is said to bring life back from death. So to have gone to the underworld and returned, although not literally, but when a goddess brings someone back to life, like Attis in, the, in her case, um, the sense is that she has been able to overcome death, which then means that she's a Chthonic goddess. Uh, Pindar continues, there too are the loudly sounding laments of the Naids, or her priestesses, the frenzied shouts of dancers that are aroused, um, and the thong that tosses the neck on the high. So this idea of everyone is dancing, everyone is frenzied, um, an orgy is is about to begin. And then I thought I found this really interesting um, article about one of the caves in Serbia that was found um, that, that was found um, that was part of. So I want to I want to see a little bit of what what they they found in the let's go with so in the mountains valleys of Serbia Serbia around three hundred CE. Romans constructed a palace complex dedicated to Emperor Gaius Valerius Galerius Maximanus, who came from that region. Within this palace, known as Felix Romuliana, stood a temple honoring the great nature goddess Kaibali, distinguished by its unique orientation compared to other Roman structures. Now, researchers, modern-day researchers, archaeologists, investigated the site's acoustics and they believe that the architect strategically positioned Kaibeli's temple where ritualistic animal sacrifices took place to harness the captivating sound and vibrations emanating from the underground currents, near, water currents nearby. So it's fascinating to me that they set up this temple inside this cave 
to echo and to sound a certain way. Utilizing modern techniques in archaeoacoustics and electromagnetic sensing, experts from the SB Research Group concluded that Kaibeli's temple was deliberately aligned to align with the direction of vibrations and low frequency sounds likely produced by flowing water. In this paper, there's this fantastic paper, if you want to read more about it, called Archaeoacoustic Analysis of Kaibeli's Temple, Imperial Roman Palace of Felix Romuliana in Serbia. If you need the link to that, please email me. I'll send it to you. Researchers suggest that the temple's designers capitalized on the natural phenomena to influence human brainwaves and enhance the psychological experience. I mean, think about the the detail that went into creating this. The detected sounds fall below the range of human hearing, typically between 18 to 20 hertz. The researcher speculates that Galerius's mother Romula, who resided in the palace until she died, um, employed seers known as augurs to locate the water source and subsequent, subsequently contracted the temple nearby. The low frequency sounds were reported reportedly perceptible on the skin surface, affecting the worshiper's sensory experiences. So you can't hear it, but you feel it on your skin, like goosebumps. I mean, could you imagine the genius that went into this? Researchers propose that such sounds could evoke a sense of awe or fear, potentially alerting the worshiper's psyche likening the sensation to being enveloped in the depths of Mother Earth. They suggest that these frequencies may have created an atmosphere of excitement akin to being immersed in the darkness of the Great Mother's womb or within the pit where the blood of sacrificed animals was poured into the worshippers in a minute. So I want you to think about we, you know, if you haven't seen the episode that I do on caves and the womb, please go check it out. But remember, we talked about how caves are such important areas of worship in sort of neo the Neolithic period and all the way clearly to the Roman period. But the the work, the genius, the detail that goes into creating an experience for this particular goddess, and perhaps for others, but for this one, we have proof that allow the worshipers to experience something supernatural almost. I mean, it's actually quite natural because it comes from the water and the sound and the cave, but it feels supernatural. It just, it blew my mind when I came across this article because I want to live in a society in which I can go worship a goddess and experience, have the sort of fascinating experience. I, I really, I, I mean, I've been to Eleusis and I've been to other spaces and, and I will continue to go to these places, perhaps even this one in Serbia and, and document that for us. But documenting is, is one step. Experiencing is just, yeah, it's a dream. Yeah. So let's talk about these rites, these orgiastic festivals in Phrygia. Yeah. Um, very, very fascinating, the rites for Kaibali. So no contemporary texts or myths exist to provide any insight into the Phrygian cult. So everything that I'm reading to you is not original and it is not written by the worshipers. In fact, one could argue that it is written by those who observed and later on by Christian writers. So we have to be very, very careful. Um, we, the Phrygians, along with other successor states such as of the Hittite Empire, um, continued to worship Kaibali well into and after the Greco-Roman period. So we do know that um, this ritual that started in Phrygia continues actually well into the Roman period. And we're going to talk about how the Romans uh, begin to be super sensitive about it and then start being more and more conservative, more and more conservative. Now, the Phrygians emigrated from uh, emigrated to Anatolia, sorry, from Thrace in the early Iron Age. And they may have incorporated aspects of the Thracian cult of Dionysus in their rituals. There is quite a bit of overlap between Kaibali's wild orgiastic parties worship 
and the Dionysian wild orgiastic party. So there is, but what this might also tell us is that people really enjoyed divinities that had wild orgiastic parties. Um, and, and why shouldn't they, right? Um, and so these ecstatic practices were quite fitting for a god or a goddess of nature, okay? So one of these rituals involves self-castration of some of the priests, known as Gala, as we'll see, and emulating Attis, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, the orgiastic festivals of the Phrygian mother of the gods were introduced to Greece through the island of Samothrace and um, were sometimes associated with or overlap, like I said, Dionysus. Yeah. Much of these um, nocturnal festivals uh, featured drinking, dancing, like I said, magic music, excuse me, I'm going to call it magic music, including rattles, kettle drums, flutes, castanets, ritual cries, so there was howling, roaring, animalistic sounds, and like I said, mutual mutilation, ritual mutilation, so from the castration, self, self castration, to flagging yourself or flagellation, um, or any kind of, there's a sort of idea that there was a lot of bleeding that was going on for, for the goddess. Again, we got to take this with a bit of a grain of salt. Some of it is true as we have other evidence, but some of it is also in the imagination of, of authors. So I have here several, several uh, first uh, primary, what we call primary text. Um, there are lots, I'm just thinking which one to uh, to read to you. Um, there's one, for example, by Stesichorus, which is written in 7th to 6th century BC. And he says, an ox eating lion came to the cave mouth. With the flat of his hands, he struck the great timbrel. So here is a lion that comes in, according to this source, to beat the drum. He was carrying, sorry, he was carrying a drum. And the whole cave rang with the din. The forest beast could not abide the holy booming of Kaibali and raced quickly up the forested mountain, afraid of the goddess's half-woman servant, which is another word for a eunuch priest, who hung up as dedication their garments and yellow locks. So there's this mystery um, around the orgiastic practices. Of course, the Galai priests are there um, and other and the and the priestesses are there, but that that animals show up and participate in or try to hit the drums or howl or roar alongside the others. Yeah. Um, uh, Aristophanes says the mighty cho choirs who extol Kybele are on the mountaintops. Okay. Uh, Plato says, like the celebrants of the Corybantic rites, when they perform the enthronement of the person whom they're about to initiate there, as you know, if you have been through it, they have dancing and merrymaking. So lots of primary source there. Plato also talks about, uh, he also put some words in Socrates' mouth when uh, in, in Eon, where he says, um, Kybele's rev revelers, when they dance, are not in their right mind by divine inspiration and by possession. Okay. Just as the Kybele revelers to have a quick perception of that strain only which is appropriated to the god by whom they are possessed and have plenty of dances and words for that but take no heed of any other <laughs> sometimes plato writes and you're like what the hell is he saying yeah um the reason why i bring up these primary sources although they are still late in the worship of um of Kybele, is because these are the only texts that we have that attest to the fact that this practice was still ongoing at the time. But we have to understand that these people that are writing, certainly Plato, Aristophanes, and others, are not actually participating in the rites. And at least they don't tell us that they've ever participated in the rites. And so they're telling us what they heard. <laughs> you know, it's like playing telephone, or they're telling us what people say, but it's not first-hand accounts, and we have no first-hand accounts, yeah. Um, as far as the actual sacrifice, we know that it, for, for in the Phrygian rites, there is um, a sacrifice of bulls often. There is a sacrifice sometimes of other animals as well, like obviously 
um, deer, sometimes dogs, sometimes you can, you can, you, you can find a source that says dogs. Um, we know that it, part of these as part of these rites has to do with Kaibali being a mediator between the realms of the known and the unknown, so that the ecstatic state is a way in which to connect to that mystery space, that space between the living and the dead. Um, and also this idea of ferocity, um, wildness, the escape of the city, the escape of the civilized, uh, the so-called civilized life in the city. Yeah. Um, Anatolian elites then uh, wanted to harness Kybele's protective influence um, through a forms of kind of a ruler cult. So remember how I said in the beginning, she was uh, the people's goddess and then the elites started to really own, wanted to own her rights. Uh, so for example, uh, Midas built a monument to Phrygia, which links her to King Midas, either as his patron, patron or consort or co-divinity. And she becomes the guardian of city states. So you can't see in this, if you're not watching me, if you're not watching this, um, what I've done is I've posted some of the pictures of her depiction in cult statue over time. And here, for example, in this one, um, she is sitting on a chair still. She's got two male lions uh, on each side. She has the drum or timbrel in her hand, but she also has like a little building or a little building on her head. And so what happens is as she begins to be associated with cities and rulers and the elites, she begins to be called, she begins to be a TK, which is sort of, um, usually that is a goddess that protects a city. And there's lots of TK, there's a literal TK in the Roman period, uh, but um, there's lots of TK goddesses. So when you see a goddess that wears a city on her head, Artemis of Ephesus also does that, other goddesses do that. Um, she is then represented as the protector of the city, the guardian of the city or city states. And so now you see this crown that she's wearing, which represents city walls. But no matter how much they tried to harness her politically, the wildness in her worship was something they could not control. They could not control. Yeah. Um, in the second century, Pausanias, who is traveling around, describes a Magnesian, a Lydian cult, uh, honoring the mother of the gods with an image carved into the rock spur of Mount Stipilis, um, believed to be one of the oldest representations of the goddess. And so, again, what that means is that her worship continued to be out in the mountains, continued to be out in the forest. It required a kind of space, a, a, a sacred space, a non-liminal space in which people could worship. Yeah. So let's talk about Attis because Over time, I've talked about this before. Over time, goddesses, especially powerful goddesses, are given a consort, a husband, a servant, a dude, <laughs> a dude who is um, usually some type of, I don't know, attachment, let's say. Callimachus tells us about Attis in the third century BCE, he says, Tossing my hair to honor Kybele to the sound of the Phrygian flute uh, in a trailing robe, alas, to mourn Adonis or Attis, in this case, the slave of the goddess. So Attis is an interesting um, figure. Now, some scholars believe that Attis served as a designation among Kybele's priests or priest kings so that some of them were called Attis. Um, most myths depict Attis as the founder of her priestly class of the galley, of the priesthood. And um, there are so many renditions over time you can imagine. Uh, Servius's account, for example, during the Roman imperial era, which is one of the most later accounts, uh, presents this other narrative. He says, um, Attis castrates a king to evade unwanted advances only to be castrated in turn by a dying king. And then he's discovered by Kybele's priest beneath a pine tree and Attis meets his demise, prompting the priest to, in, to inter him and undergo self-emasculation in his honor. Now, that is a later interpretation of why do um, 
Kybele's priests emasculate themselves with castration, right? A very, very interesting question. Um, modern scholarship generally agrees that her consorts and her eunuch priests likely accompanied the goddess's arrival way, way back, 8,000 years ago, and that they were originally there as part of the ecstatic rites um, and certainly they are there in the Phrygian tradition and the Greek tradition. And so Attis is sort of the first, seen as the first man to emasculate himself, to to have or perform self-castration for um, for the goddess. Yeah. Um, like I said, the Roman sensibility begin to really, uh, I don't know, I guess they feel a little more offended. Uh, Romans are the uh, epitome of patriarchy, right? So I, I guess, you know, when that whole Roman Empire trend was going on, it probably was not uh, a mistake that so many men think about the Roman Empire and not the Greeks or the Persians or other the Anatolians or others, because the Roman Empire is really the epitome of patriarchy. And the issue with that for Kaibali is that they could not imagine why these men, biological men, and you know, uh, went through these festivals or ecstatic rites and then self castrated themselves. And so they they begin to tell these other stories, you know, that it's some type of punishment or it's, you know, they, they try to associate it more with masculinity than embodying the feminine. Yeah. Um, now, much of the mythological stories uh, with Attis describe, described by Greek and Roman uh, sources do describe him as her, a youthful consort and a Phrygian deity. And we can see in this image, for example, that he has a Phrygian uh, little hat on. And that's one of the ways to actually really be able to uh, know what is a Phrygian divinity. They often wear this, this little hat Um but like I said, Attis originally served as the um, the common name for the or the priestly title for uh, Kybele's uh, priests, and he seems to be quite popular. The name and, and the uh, the consort seems to have followed her through uh, Magna Graecia and lots, you know, through time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a prominent and interesting ceremony for Attis that is celebrated at the onset of spring. So one of the fascinating things about Attis is that he dies in the spring and he's born again. Okay. So in this, in this ceremony, which is celebrated in the spring, kind of like another ceremony, we continue to celebrate in the spring, especially in the modern period. This ceremony involved cutting a pine tree and adorning it with violets, symbolizing, symbolizing drops of Attis's blood. The high priest would then make a cut in his arm, offering blood to the goddess, while the other priests engage in different ritualistic acts, ensuring drops of their blood fell on the sacred pine tree. Okay, So there is this uh, sacrifice at the beginning of the festival, and then um, there is a dying part of the festival, which we're going to look at, and then there's a resurrection part of the festival. Hmm, sounds familiar, yeah? Um, and Attis is the key player here. And notice this association with the pine tree, right? Really reminds us of Christmas and this association with decorating the pine tree um, and, and having the pine tree in our home, even though obviously for Christians and certainly for Jesus, there was no pine tree in Bethlehem at the time of his birth. So the pine tree is very, very deeply associated with Attis and Attis dies and is reborn again in the spring. So there are some very deep connections here between a very popular ritual and uh, a modern interpretation of that ritual. Yeah. Uh, we do have an interesting origin story for Attis that's recounted in uh, Ovid's Fasti. Uh, and uh, it goes, it says some, it goes like Kybele is in love with a handsome, with a handsome shepherd boy who has to pledge eternal fidelity. But when he falls under the irresistible spell of a nymph, the avenging hang that the goddess strikes. The nymph Sangaritis, daughter of the river Sangarius, is killed and Attis becomes insane. 
He is obsessed with delusions and thinks himself persecuted by the Irenes and Furies. With the aid of a sharp stone, he deprives himself of those parts of his body, which were the cause of his infidelity. Flowers spring from his blood, and he himself is changed into a pine tree. Okay. So the pine tree is the embodiment of Attis, but also the embodiment of his blood sacrifice and his castration sacrifice for the goddess Kaibali. Okay. Um, and so this explains some of the self-castration of the Galai or the priests, right? Um, and it harkens back to this mythology that in order to remain, remain loyal to the goddess, the male priests had to castrate themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. There... There is this interesting, actually, um, piece, I was just looking at my notes, by the Christian apologist Arnobius in the 4th century CE. And he really writes this really vivid, detailed account of um, Attis that is, of course, anti-pagan, right? And so he portrays their cult as scandalous and depraved. Um, and he talks about how there is this sort of... Um, unmanliness, um, there is a, a deprivation, um, hmm, um, an, uh, you know, an evilness almost, a demonic almost possession that goes on for the Kaibali cult. And of course, he's really writing propaganda for Christians to leave the popular Kaibali cult. cult. So there are several uh, festivals and rituals, moving on to festivals and rituals um, for Kaibali. Uh, I want to talk about two uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the mysteries that involve a sort of symbolic uh, death and rebirth. But I want to talk about two. I want to talk about Hilaria, which is the spring festival, and uh, Tarabolium, which is another bloody festival. So Hilaria is, this is also where we have the word Hilaria is from. It, it's the Greek word for cheerful or merry. And these, this festival is, was observed by the ancient Romans on the March equinox. So the equinox, the spring equinox, uh, to pay homage to Kaibali. And it again, it um, evolved around Attis, right? So this, there's some stories that say that Kaibali was so jealous because Attis fell in love with someone else after he promised himself to her. And so he had to castrate himself or kill himself. Either way, Attis sacrifices himself for his goddess, okay? Kaibali, we are told, especially for the festival of Hil Hilaria, then feels terrible. And then she goes to Zeus in this case. Although if we trace it all the way back to Anatolia or Phrygia, there's no Zeus. So she goes and brings back, yeah, resurrects him back to life. Okay. And this resurrection story is the story of life, death, and rebirth. Now, you're not surprised that in the spring equinox, we have a story of rebirth. Okay. Now, there is... Um, even to this day, actually, there are still in some places in, you know, the Mediterranean where people still practice a three-day Hilaria celebration, um, though maybe not so publicly, although maybe now they probably, um, practice it more. But this in the, in the ancient world, or certainly in the world of the Romans, this was a three-day festival. Yeah. Right, a week long, a week long festival. And so I thought I would take you quickly through uh, what it did, and you tell me if it seems familiar to you. Right. So March fifteen, for example, is when it started. It is marked by Attis's birth and his discovery in the reeds along the Phrygian River and Sangarius with the reed carried by the canivores. So this is very Moses like. Yeah, he, he is discovered in the reeds. Okay. March 22, we suddenly get to Addis's death under a pine tree. Okay, so seven days later, uh, we get to Addis's birth uh, under a pine tree um, with the dendrophores cutting down the tree, suspending the image of Attis, suspending the image of Attis and carrying it to the temple. Yeah. So March 15, it's the Ides of March, and this is when Addis is born. And we all know that it's an interesting story about the Ides of March and Caesar and blah, blah, blah. But March 22nd is where it really begins. And this is with the death of Attis. 
March 23rd, the tree is laid to rest at the Temple of Magna Mater, so Kaibeli, accompanied by the traditional be beating shields of the priests of Mars. So there's a, there's a beating, there's a sound. March 24, devotees in a frenzy of mourning whip themselves to sprinkle altars and effigies with blood, some performing self-castration. So this is the weekend for self-castration, okay? Or the week, March break, yeah? <laughs> On March 25th, yeah, Hilaria celebrates Addis's rebirth, potentially associated with early, of course, Christian sources linking it to Jesus's resurrection. Big surprise. Uh, March 26th is a day of rest, the following day, okay? Um, and then March 27th, we have a bathing of Kaibeli's sacred stone and iron implements. So there's a bathing of the temple. There's a clean cleansing of the cult statue, symbolizing purification. And finally, on March 28th, we have the initiations into the mystery of Kaibeli and Attis near the Phrygian um, sanctuary. Okay. So this festival is about a week long, although, like I said, in the Ides of March, uh, is the birth of Attis or celebrating the birth of Attis. Um, different places and at different times may have celebrated these days, you know, a little bit differently, longer, shorter, et cetera. Uh, we have this very detailed information from the Roman period. So we'll, we'll take that. But this is clearly a, a resurrection um, festival that is clearly duplicated by the Christians uh, with Jesus. Even the fact that they carry, so they cut down the tree. So there's like a wood, like a cross, and then it had suspending the image of Attis on it and carrying it to the temple. It reminds me of the image of Jesus carrying the cross or carrying the wood or the tree, you could say, to, um, I don't remember where he's carrying it to, I guess where they where they stick it so that they can put him on it, yeah? So this kind of self-sacrificing, this, and then the priests are self-flagellating, they're, they're bleeding, right? In the same way that one could argue that Jesus' crown of thorns is on his head and he's bleeding and he's tired. So there's this really fascinating, you know, now that I think of it, there's this really fascinating tradition cross-culturally of a male divinity dying at the spring equinox and being reborn, but dying. Um, I'm thinking of all of the cultures that sacrifice consorts, uh, and of course Dionysus and others, but uh, that sacrifice consorts at the spring equinox. So there's something about the masculine dying in spring and being reborn again that seems to feel natural for us. Um, notice that there's no female goddesses dying and being reborn again. Like in, the more I think of it, there are no female goddesses other than Persephone who goes into the underworld for six months, but she doesn't die. I mean, she's married, which I guess one could argue is a kind of death. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not a death, right? She's not being resurrected. Um, she goes and she comes back. But other than Persephone, and I know Inanna goes into the underworld, but again, there's not, it's not real dying. I mean, well, actually she does die in the underworld. She does die in the underworld. They bring back her body. Okay, so those two, I mean, Inanna certainly could be counted as one. But there is something about these consorts um, dying in the spring equinox. I mean, Inanna doesn't go into the underworld in the spring equinox. It's not really a spring um celebration it's more of a well that's a complex watch the inanna episode because that whole thing is very complex but i'm fascinated by this idea now i'm like on you know on this this sense that the spring equinox really even today is about the dying of something masculine and winter although winter is often represented as the crone so i don't know there's something here that's going on here and then i can't put my finger on it um but it's but it's really fascinating yeah uh of course they are reborn but um there's something about the suffering of the masculine here in honor of the feminine in honor of rebirth almost like the masculine has to die in order for everything to be okay and fertility and all of those things and be reborn for things to 
um, to go well for the rest of the year. It's fascinating. Secondly, the other one that I wanted to talk about, um, I'll talk about the Magalies, yeah, maybe later on in the course. Not that you guys can stay here for too long, but the Torabolium. The Torabolium is really fascinating. Um, these are initiation ceremonies in which a Torah or a bull was sacrificed. Um, we don't know exactly where this ritual was about, but it was certainly about purifying and renewing the devotee, or sometimes could be used as an initiation rite. But what's really fascinating is the way that these sacrifices are offered. Yeah. So the candidate, the devotee that is being cleansed or purified, stands in a pit beneath a floor fitted with a wooden grate. A bull is sacrificed above the grate, allowing its blood to fall through the holes in the wood, showering the initiates before or the devotee before, but below. This act symbolized ritual purification and spiritual rebirth. Okay. Um, if you want to see a scene of this in popular culture, in the series Rome on HBO, Atia performs a sacrifice to Kaibeli so that she can uh, protect her son Octavian. And this is the ritual. One of the things that I find fascinating about this ritual, and again, we're back to blood rituals and bathing in blood or soaked in blood, is that blood is required for purification. Now we often see that water is required for purification and sometimes fire, but here blood is required for purification. And what's really, really fascinating is that this idea of rebirth, it reminds me of when you're giving birth or when a child is born and they're bloody, right? They come out bloody. So there's this sense that blood purifies. Yeah, it's it's very powerful. Um, and it must have been kind of gory. Although I suppose for the dev dev devotees of Kaibeli, um, that would have been pretty standard. But um, fascinating, just fascinating um, when you try to imagine it and try to imagine being in the room and the singing and the drumming. And one of the things actually that I do want to mention about sacrifice before we talk about the castration of the priests um, it is very important that we know that in the ancient world, certainly in the Greco-Roman world, but even previous to that, um, like the Minoans and others, the animal being sacrificed was not forced, literally was not tied down often. And I mean, I want to say often because it's not in every case. There are other, there are cases where this is not the was not true, but most often the animal well, the goal was that the animal looked like they're going willingly. So often the animals decorated, painted flowers, etc. And certainly, for example, in the Milo for the Minoans, it, it had to look like the animal was walking to the altar on its own willingly. Uh, so when we talk about sacrifice, it's important that we imagine not like the screaming, yelling, Hollywood, torturing, tying down, blah, blah, blah. It's important that we understand that the gods were certainly uh, the Greco-Roman and certainly Kybele and the Minoan gods, which I know of and I'm, so I can confirm, um, were said to have to not have enjoyed a brutal sacrifice is what I'm getting to. That is those who offer their blood, whether it was human or animal, had to do it willingly. Now, of course, you might say, well, is it willingly? I mean, it's an animal. How does it need? So, of course, of course. But what I want you to think about or imagine is that it's not a, a violent, um, in the sense of dragging something to and slaughtering and sort of enjoying that. So I just, I guess I, I, I want to share with you that there is, um, an honor in the sacrifice. Even the the priests themselves who are bleeding themselves are not doing it out of shame or embarrassment or it's not a servant mentality. It is a connection. So they are doing it to connect or so, you know, we talk about flagellation and I think because in flagellation and, and we're going to talk about these priests now, but, and self-castration, um, 
when we talk about flagellation in Christianity, it's usually out of shame or punishment, right? Like you're a sinner, you must bleed, you must do this, blah, blah, blah. And so we are used to thinking of that kind of bleeding out of shame, let's say, or killing something like even the way we kill our food today, like the way we kill our cattle, the way we kill our chickens, the way we kill our pigs, it is not humane and they are certainly not calm and um it, it is not a willing sacrifice, let's say. Um, in the ancient world, the bleeding, most popularly, the bleeding had to be done calmly and willingly. Like I said, for animals, of course, that's a different story because how do we know they're willing? But they were certainly calm and celebrated and well-fed and taken care of. And the 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 actual killing of the animal is done swiftly and the in the most... Um, caring of ways so the animal is not to suffer so the gods don't want suffering blood the gods don't want shameful blood the gods don't want violent or scared blood um and in part this is probably why the galli priests were in a frenzy but even in their self-castration this is something that is done willingly um these priests so now we're going to move on to the, the galley priests the eunuch priests these priests knew what they were doing before they entered it. They were ready to change their lives, their clothes, their, um, they were ready to transform their gender performance. Let's, let's use modern words. Um, so this is a celebration, not something that is forced, not something that is shameful, not something that is um, to be looked down upon. Um, and we may not understand it today. And, and the Romans certainly had a harder time understanding it than those who came before them. Uh, but it is a celebration of the goddess. And and it is an embodiment, a commitment to the goddess. So today we think about Catholic priests, for example, who so-called commit themselves to um, not having sex or any sort of sexual uh, contact. And we know that that has led to um, numerous, numerous violations. So... Where am I going with that? Um, that is not, hmm, I want to say that is not a full commitment, but because Christianity is patriarchal, uh, led by men for men with a male God, uh, castration would be seen as emasculating. And it, and I suppose it always was since the Romans. The eunuch priests, the galley priests are demonstrating their commitment, their fidelity, but more than that, because they take on the sacred feminine, they become effeminate, okay? In their clothing, in their hair, in their behavior. They are, they are embodying the goddess. And it's fascinating to me that we don't talk about the fact that, especially for Kaibali, of course, there was a leadership of women priests. They did not have to do anything because they were already embodying the goddess, as women tend to be for goddesses. So, you know, when we talk about the gender of gods, people go, oh, well, God doesn't have a gender to me. I understand that, you know, the divine is in energy. Um, but you notice that when we talk about a male God in monotheistic traditions, the males are the rulers, the males set the structure, the male is in power, the male, blah, 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 blah. And we talk, when we talk about female divinities in the ancient world, the priestesses are in charge. The priestesses are running the show. Yes, we can argue that some politicians become involved, of course, over time. Um, but priestesses have quite a deal, quite a great deal of power. And in the case of Kaibali, the eunuch priests who become effeminate, who transition into this new gender performance as feminine, also have power. So what I'm trying to say is that the gender, the perceived gender of the divine certainly affects the power structure, the hierarchy, the control of that religion. Yeah. And so while we might, you know, keep talking about how God doesn't have a gender, that's all fair and good. 
but yet we if that is the case then we would embody we would we would welcome all non-binary peoples right uh, i mean if that was the case we would celebrate actually non-gender right um so I sometimes think that people say things and they convince themselves that things don't matter, but actually in reality, they they make immense differences. And certainly when we talk about gender, whether it's biological gender or performance, um, the gender of the divinity absolutely influences the structure. And you could talk about that with Hinduism and Buddhism, you know, the Buddha is a male. I just showed my students yesterday a, a documentary on how uh, nuns or women, for example, in Tibetan Buddhism are not uh, allowed to reach enlightenment in the female body, but they need to come back as a man and practice. So absolutely gender and the gender of the divine plays a key role in the human aspect of that spirituality. So the Gala priests, I think, are fascinating because two things. Number one, self-castration was practiced often and for let's say 10,000 years for as long as this goddess existed she had galai priests as far back as we can go which means that there and she was like i showed you the map a very popular divinity so this means that the goddess and the ancients lived very comfortably understanding non-binarianism or transitioning between gender performance. Okay. So, you know, we're not talking about a biological transition in a way. Castration, really self-castration means removing the testicles, right? Um, and so I guess biologically one could still be defined as male. I mean, that's a weird sort of thing to discuss, but the performance, the lived experience was feminine and accepted accepted all the way into the Romans and later on the Christians who, of course, like we talked about, totally did not accept it. So this tells us that in the ancient world, could you imagine the plethora of different gods and goddesses? We talked about Inanna's priests also who uh, transitioned and lived um, in feminine lives uh, or feminine ways. And so you can you imagine walking around the ancient world where people really lived in these non-binary ways and moved between gender performance uh, or changed gender performance throughout their lives. And, and everyone was accepting of that um, as a reality. I mean, again, I, we can't speak for every single human in that time, but this was a reality This and it was a very popular reality. And, and so that makes us understand that it was uh, uh, most likely an accepted reality. And so I, I think it's important that we keep talking about it. I think it's important that we don't sweep uh, the galleys under the rugs um, and that we don't see them as a, a singular example in the ancient world. And that we ask our, I think they really raised that question of embodying the goddess that you worship or embodying the divine being that you worship. And I, I think, especially that you've committed to as a priest, I mean, in their daily lives, of course, men worshipped Kaibeli and they didn't have to castrate themselves. But those who dedicated their life to her as a priest had to. Um, I wanted to to leave you. I, I don't think we have time to talk about how she came to Rome. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about her in Greece and especially this statue from the Pergamon um, of Kaibeli, that's, that, that's at the Ephesus Museum. Often people talk about, so she comes to Greece in the 6th century BCE, like I've mentioned earlier, and the Greeks um, adapt the, orgi excuse me, the orgiastic rites. Uh, there's a cult to her in Athens, okay? Um, and of course, this continuation of Addis as her consort and all that. My favorite thing, though, is this image. And and uh, if you're not watching, you're just listening to me. Um, it is this image of Kaibeli standing. And she's standing with two lions beside her. And she's wearing this city crown of a tike on her head. And she's just wearing a traditional Greek uh, peplos. But on her stomach, right under her breast, there are these bumps. 
And you may be familiar with this if you're listening, um, but you can also, again, Google Greek Kybele or Metertheon uh, Kybele. Um, and often people will say that this is the many-breasted Kybele. And I'm just showing you this image. And if you're listening to me while you're driving or doing whatever, trust me when I tell you that these image, this image with the so-called bump slash breasts are not breasts. Now, as so many of you know, <laughs> as I'm working through this Artemis of Ephesus book, I will have a whole chapter on the fact that the protrusions on her body are not breasts because there's no nipples. I mean, I mean, I, I I find that a very basic uh, visual cue. <laughs> and yet there are still people go that, no, these are breasts. No, these are not breasts. Breasts have nipples. And the ancients knew what a breast looked like. Like, let's give them some credit. There's lots of depictions of Aphrodite with naked breasts. There are no nipples. And that's because they're not breasts. They are absolutely hives or queen bee eggs. And I will prove that in Artemis of Ephesus beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but what's fascinating about this particular statue is that this is one of the exemplars that people go, oh, well, Artemis of Ephesus comes from Kybele, I agree, or is, you know, comes out of the tradition of Kybele. And we have the statue of Kybele that's many breasted. And I have yet to see one statue in the ancient world where I could identify the bumps as breasts especially across your stomach. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> uh, I'm quite passionate about this because it's been a battle I've been fighting for some time. Uh, I, I don't know how to make it more clear. The bumps on her body or certain Kybele's body are certainly not breasts. Okay. And we actually don't have, as you can see, all the different terms that I've used for her today. There is no many breasted. Yeah, that's, again, a, a, a much later modern interpretation. Um, and so I wanted to bring you this statue and show you. I just want to analyze it visually that there are no nipples on these bumps. In fact, Kybele in this statue has two breasts where they belong and they are very covered. And this is another actually very important aspect about Kybele. She is never naked, never, never naked. Uh, there's something very maternal about her in her depiction, so certainly in Greco-Roman um, representation. Now, if we go back to that Anatolian piece that I showed you, she's totally naked. Um, and that's because 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, all of the depictions of the sacred feminine are naked. And in, in that case, as we've talked about, she's giving birth. But as we move through Phrygia to Greece to Rome, she is completely covered. And in fact... Um, when we look at Rome, where she fully embodies, so I have this image of her in her Roman interpretation. Um, she is actually an older woman. You can cl see, clear, clearly see from her face. She's got the lion beside her. She's got a cornucopia in her hand. So she's adapted Demeter or Ceres for Rome. She's got this massive TK, massive city on her head. And she's wearing a veil, which is a very matronly depiction. So we move from the Anatolian naked giving birth to the to the Phrygian, let's say, Greek, where she's more of a younger woman, fully clothed now, sitting on a throne with two lions, male lions at this point, and this TK city on her head, to the matronness of Rome. Now, you know that the Romans were obsessed with their mothers, right? I mean, they... As a patriarchal society, they worshipped mothering and mothers. And to this day, one could argue that Italian men worship their mothers. That is not the same thing as feminist power, though. Let me just make a little side note there. Um, although one could argue that there are many powerful women in Rome or mothers in Rome. Um, but this, uh, what I mean is it's not a matriarchy, uh, right? It's very much a patriarchy. But... The Rome, Romans really worshipped the matron, the mother, and their own mothers, etc. And there are many powerful mothers in, in, in Rome. So it's not a surprise that Kybele becomes this uh, great mother. But I wanted to read you um, the how she arrives in Rome in 204 BCE. Yeah, because it's really, really interesting that she doesn't touch the ground. Okay? 
like I said, the Romans really, um, I can't find a word, but they, they take out more and more and more of her wild, ecstatic, orgiastic aspects uh, in the same way that the Roman Catholic Church, you know, takes away all of the goddesses empowerment and, and makes the Virgin Mary a mother and a virgin and that's it. Um, so we see a kind of limitation more and more and more women are more and more closeted, more and more limited uh, in, in the name of sacredness, right? Like so they become pedestaled of this sort of sacred epitome, virginal perfection, et cetera, uh, but lose a lot of their organic wrathful power. Okay. So this happens to Kybele as well over time. Um, and so when she arrives in Rome, we have this, this statement from Livy. And he says that Publius Cornelius was ordered to go to Astia with all the matrons, so lots of matrons in power here, to meet the goddess and himself to receive her from the ship and carry her to land and turn her over to the matrons to carry. So these are her priestesses, our matrons. After the ship had reached the mouth of the river, uh, Tiber, in compliance with the order, he sailed out into the open water on a ship and received the goddess from her priests, the galley, and carried her to land. The foremost matrons in the state, so the most elite matrons, so now we're moving into a place of power, received her. The matrons passed the goddess from hand to hand in an unbroken succession to each other while the entire city poured out to meet her. So she did not, this statue, I can't even imagine, did not touch the ground. Women passed her from hand to hand or used their hands to carry her. A censor had been placed before the doors along the route of the bearers and kindling their incense. People prayed that the gracious and benignant uh, Kybele might enter the city of Rome. Uh, and it was to the Temple of Victory, which is on the Palatine, on Palatine Hill, that they carried the goddess on that day before the Ides of April. And that was a holy day. Uh, the people thronged to the Palatine bearing gifts for the goddess. And there was a banquet of the gods and games. And this was called, of course, a Megalesia. Now, we didn't talk about Megalesia. Um, but like I said, if you want to learn more, please join me in the Kybele course, because there I will have a lot more time to go into all these details. Um, there is some stuff that we have to kind of skip over um, so that I don't make this three hours long. Uh, although I do enjoy being with you guys for three hours. Uh, but I just, you know, it, it's so important that she arrives untouched. Now, if you've ever read the Infancy Gospel of James, Again, this is a side note about the Virgin Mary and connecting her to Catholicism. In the infancy gospel of James, it is said that when Mary was born, she only walked seven steps on the earth. And after that, she was carried by virgins and angels. And that she never touched the ground until they took her to the temple. Because I don't know why Christians thought that synagogues had daycares. But um, they took her to the temple and left her there with the priests. Maybe one day I will do a whole podcast on the infancy gospel of James. Although I love Mary, but I mean, the infancy God, anyways, so I don't want to go on the side rant, but what's important there and the reason why I bring it up is that she was carried. She was not allowed to touch the ground in this gospel, which dates to the third, no, sorry, I think it's about 150 CE, 170 CE that the infancy gospel of James is, is written. Um, but the key here is that there's this connection of sacredness that the Virgin Mary as a child was so sacred that she wasn't allowed to touch the ground. And what I'm saying is that this tradition of not allowing something sacred or someone sacred in the case of, a, uh, of Kybele and the Virgin Mary to touch the ground reaches back to this great mother in Rome and this tradition of the great mother in Rome. And then, of course, it's not a coincidence that the Virgin Mary is a great mother for the Roman Catholic Church. So there's this connection, uh, and I can't say whether it's done on purpose or not, but certainly we can see this connection. Yeah? So the Romans adored Kylie. Like I said, they adored mothering goddesses. They loved everything that was matronal, and matrons had quite a bit of power in ancient Rome. Now, I promised you I'd mentioned modern worship. So in closing, um, if you would like to uh, see what modern worship for Kybele looks like, I invite you to um, join or look up 
um, the Matrium of Kaibeli in upstate New York. They're an organization um, that is based on the divine feminine principle of ancient pagans, particularly pagan feminists. Um, and they are a charitable organization uh, who live through holistic feminism. Their founder is Catherine Platine, um, and they worship they they worship they practice i can't I, I can't speak to whether or not they have events of orgiastic rites um certainly their website has not said that so but they practice some kind of worship in honor of kaibeli um and so if you would like to see what that looks like in the modern world i i welcome you to uh, look them up they're called the uh maetrium of kaibeli in new york m a e t r e u m for those of you um, listening. So um, if you want to join me for after the podcast, um, I want to thank you very much for listening to this um, episode so far. But after the podcast, I have a treat for you. <laughs> um, the Phrygian uh, cult of Kaivali and Agdistis, as I promised. Um, this is a fascinating cult uh, which I, um, I will talk about in after the podcast. After the podcast is a short episode, 20 minutes, half an hour max, in which I pick something that is a little more gruesome, <laughs> um, a little more fascinating, or a little bit outside the norm to, to share with my Patreon subscribers. So if you'd like to join me on Patreon uh, under the Goddess Project podcast, um, after the podcast will be made available on Monday. Um, and here we're going to talk about Kaibali um, Adgestis, which is this cult um, that believed that Kaibali and Adgestis are living in one body. And so this is a very intersex, intersex um, divinity. It's fascinating, right? Half man, half woman in the depiction, like half feminine, half masculine in the depiction. Um, you can see the statue here. There's sort of a, a masculine side and a feminine side, and then there's other statues that I'm going to share with you. But um, it's it's fascinating. It was immensely popular. Um, and yeah, so if you're interested in that, join me in after the podcast. Um, if not, that's all right. I just want to thank you for listening and thank you for joining me and thank you for your comments, your feedback, subscribing. If you really enjoy this podcast, please share it on your social media and share it to your, with your friends. Um, I am looking for ways to raise funding for all of my research, particularly the research travel that I have to do to achieve my goals. Um, and while this account is small for now, I hope that it will grow and allow me enough freedom alongside, obviously, all the teaching that I do and other things that I do um, to uh, travel and document um, the goddess Artemis and other goddesses along the way. Um, so I want to thank you so much for watching and for staying with me. And um, I hope you have a wonderful day. And I will see you next time. I think next time we're going to talk about Atargatis, which is a fascinating goddess. Um, so I will see you next time. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day.